All right. Well, Dr. Donati, thank you so much for making time to come out on our podcast today. And for any of our listeners who don't know you just yet, could you please tell us a little bit just about yourself? Yeah. So um, I have been in practice now for 15 years, graduated in 2006 from uh, Pennsylvania College of Optometry, which is now Salus. Um, yeah, I started really doing VT right after graduation, um, you know, started with just, you know, maybe a patient a year and doing the therapy myself in the exam room with what little equipment I had purchased from the school's shop uh, yeah. and what was required in our BV lab, right? And, and uh, kind of got going that way. But I knew that it was always something that I kind of wanted to incorporate into my practice after I graduated, um, I myself was a VT patient while I was in school and it had made a um, very significant impact on, uh, on my life really. And kind of was the driving force and actually, you know, getting me through school in, in a lot of ways. So uh, I knew it was something that I wanted to make sure that I used uh, and, you know, made my patients have the same benefits that, uh, that I did. So that was kind of it from the beginning of things and slowly increase the number of patients per year that I saw in VT. Uh, and in 2014, myself and a bunch of other passionate, like-minded uh, ODs formed what was back then COVTNR, the Canadian Optometrist and Vision Therapy and Rehabilitation, um, because that is a big mouthful. We changed the name <laughs> to um, Vision Therapy Canada. And uh, so I'm currently the president of VTC uh, for another few months and uh, was the founding vice president. So that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. And those are, that's, that's a great accomplishment. And you also took out that you, you know, you lecture for OEP as well. And you lecture for things like learning during quarantine, which is how yes. we discovered who you were before I started working <laughs> with you. <laughs> yes. Um, a lot of fun. Yeah. And those, so those lectures were um, for us, a window into Canadian optometry and just, you know, how people kind of practice here um, since we all graduated from a U.S. school. And yeah. your lecture was very, very interesting because it's not really the normal way to treat amblyopia or how people are approaching amblyopia uh, therapy. Right. So you know, in that main lecture that you had on the LDQ uh, website, you said, you know, leave patching for the pirates. You know, it's not for kids, leave it for them. Um, don't do it in your amblyopic kids. So can you talk a little bit more about why patching therapy may not be as successful as we, as it's made out to be? Well, I mean, patching very much is, is kind of the go-to therapy. It's certainly what we're, you know, mostly taught in school as, as the go-to treatment and um, it's very easy for us to prescribe. Um, you know, it's the, the work isn't for us at that point. The, the work really then falls to the, the patient and the family mm -hmm. uh, to make that happen. And, you know, really what we do know is that uh, up to half of patients who we prescribe patching to are not successful in achieving um, the, the end result visual acuity that we want. Uh, and of those 50% of kids who actually are successful, we know that one, uh, that a quarter of those will actually fail or have a recurrence of their amblyopia within one year of stopping the patching. Mm -hmm. And 60% of them will have an amblyopia recurrence after five years of, of stopping the patching therapy. So, you know, what we're doing when we prescribe patching to these young children, the majority of times you know, it is younger children that are getting this, um, you know, initial diagnosis. What we're doing is we are asking a child to go against their nature by, you know, looking through uh, an eye that they don't want to use uh, mm -hmm. and experiencing the world in a way that they don't want to. And, you know, forcing that responsibility onto the parent to try to enforce something that mm -hmm. the child hates, the parent hates doing it to them that it seems cruel to them and you know ultimately it is you know yeah. there's also the the bullying heaven forbid anyone would would see the child wearing the patch uh, and there unfortunately are still some of our colleagues who are not aware that 
um, you know, two hours a day of patching is plenty from a research standpoint, uh, and they don't actually have to be in the patch all day. So, yeah. you know, th there's, there's better ways to achieve better binocular results. And so really the only thing that I use patching for, you know, black occlusive patching for is in the vision therapy room with activities, certain yeah. activities for very short periods of time. Yeah. I've met so many adult amblyopic patients who absolutely hate their eye doctors now. They hate optometry. They hate everything about seeing an eye doctor because they are scarred for life about that eye patch that they had to wear when they went to school at five mm -hmm. years old. And like, it sticks with them. You know, they'll tell you at the age of 40, they'll be like, oh, I still remember I had this, you know, darn eye patch on my eye when I was like five or six. I hated it. So yeah, it makes a big impact on their life in general, but yeah. And it affects how they see themselves, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, you know, better way to make a child feel like there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Than, you know, you have to wear this thing on your face. It's like the, you know, optometric scarlet letter, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, that there's really not a whole lot of reason that we should be enforcing the use of patching nowadays. Yeah. You already kind of touched a little bit on this, but uh, why should vision therapy be offered as an initial treatment instead of patching or pushing plus on spectacle prescriptions for amblyopic patients? Well, it, it's a good question. And what I would say, you know, first and foremost, is that we really have to remember that amblyopia is not a monocular problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, this is a binocular problem. This is at its very core, a binocular problem. And in, in I mean, if you look at the, the history of patching, patching has been used even in the 1800s as treatment for, for, um, for amblyopia. And it really hasn't changed a whole lot since then. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and when we look at the logic of it back then was you have a bum eye, and we are going to occlude the better one to force the bad one to work. And that's ultimately the logic. And if you follow that logic, then it does seem to make a certain amount of sense. But when we take into account the fact that amblyopia is a binocular condition, then it really does not make any sense to treat a binocular problem by occluding an eye. You are only further training that patient to be monocular, you're just trading which one they use for a short period of time, right? Um, so we really need to consider the fact that vision training is really at its core the way that we are going to train a patient, train a brain of the patient to use the eyes together in the way that they were designed to uh, from mm -hmm. a neurological standpoint. So neurological training that's going to teach the brain how to use both parts yep. of the brain, <laughs> both halves, yeah. both channels of the eyes. So, you know, when we're talking about pushing plus okay. um, and, uh, you know, cycloplegic refraction and, and whatnot, that really does serve to push the eyes further apart. And so, you know, we we're taught to cycloplege and get the best possible prescription. On, on that eye. And the logic behind that is that we are, in a sense, what we're doing is giving the eye the best chance, right? You mm -hmm. give them the, the best prescription and that gives them the best chance of having binocularity. But when we give them full plus, we're not giving them the best chance of getting binocularity. What we're doing is pushing them further into an artificial state, okay? And the, the LDQ lecture that you were you know, referring to earlier, I gave an example of uh, a patient who we have in office, brand new patient, first eye exam, and this is your traditional stereotypical amblyope, right? Plano in one eye and you dry scope plus four in the other, which is most often what it happens to be is somewhere in the, the plus four ballpark, right? Mm -hmm. And we find that with that plus four, they're maybe somewhere around 2060, let's say. And then you cycloplege that patient and you find plus six, okay? And with that plus six, maybe they are 
twenty sixty plus or or somewhere in that ballpark, right? Twenty fifty even, let's say. Mm -hmm. So when we prescribe that plus six, no one that I'm aware of has ever had the patient back the next day wearing that plus six with the cycloplegia worn off and check the visual acuity. Okay. And what we would find, because I have done that, what we would find is that the visual acuity is worse than when they presented initially. Yeah. And so what we're doing, if the patient actually does wear the glasses and doesn't reject them, which let's be honest, happens a lot. Um, if they actually were to wear them and if the parent were to actually insist that they wear them and they were to actually get used to them, then what you find is the unaided acuity drops to be worse than what it was when they presented in the first place unaided with their amblyopic eye. So we've essentially staple gunned the patient to this very high anisometropia that they now have to live with and we patch them for good measure, right? You know, really what makes more sense is to do a proper subjective refraction like you would do on any other patient and find the best possible visual acuity. When we have the best visual acuity, then we know that the patient is going to have the best chance of binocularity. And that happens absolutely with the addition of vision therapy as well. Mm -hmm. I, myself, and a lot of other doctors, every time we cycle somebody, we're always more lenient to give them more plus. And I, I personally have done that too. You know, yeah. I'm always like, oh my God, this person's amblyopic. And like, as you said, we always think of that one eye. We don't think it's binocular. We're always like, okay, yeah. one eye is the bad eye. The other eye is the good eye. And then that's how you, we tend to describe it to our, the parents too, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, this is the bad eye. We've got to make it stronger. Um, when I watched your lecture, I, it changed the way I thought. It changed the yeah. way I did uh, sorry, red, wet, wet, red, because then I was like, okay, I see what I'm getting, but I know I'm not prescribing that because at the end of the day, there's no point in you doing all this if the patient isn't going to wear the glasses. And then, yeah. um, and you pointing out that you're creating more an ISO. And I was like, yeah, I never thought about that before. You know, it's uh, yeah. definitely changed the way I practice in clinic now when I deal with kids and I definitely feel more comfortable now, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and we also have to remember as well that this, for the majority of the time, it's a shock to the family, right? That the yeah. parents, the majority of the time had no clue that this was happening. Mm -hmm. They were just, you know, I'm, I just brought this kid because I was bringing the other kid, you yeah. know, this was a twofer for me. You know, I, yeah. I never <laughs> wasn't expecting anything was going to be wrong with, with this kid. Yeah. Um, and so now not only are we saying, yeah, there's something very wrong. Here's a very thick pair of glasses. <laughs> that they, by the way, hate wearing and are going to mm -hmm. fight you every second of every day wearing. Yeah. You know, as a parent, I would say, you know what? Something is not right here. I need a second opinion. I need a third opinion. I need yeah. someone who is going to make this make sense to me. And I need someone who's going to prescribe a pair of glasses that this kid is going to actually wear. Mm -hmm. The expectation is that we are going to be working toward a goal. The parents are educated on what we're doing. Um, and that there is likely going to be multiple pairs of glasses in this child's future. Yeah, that's a good point. I tell my parents all the time in the room, just because we're giving them their first pair of glasses today, this isn't the one and only, depending on how accepting they are. I always give them that kind of expectation. Even maybe every six months, we may have to change it. It all depends on how the child's growing and how their vision is, is go, getting along in the glasses. So Dr. Donati, we want to get into more detail about the specialized prescribing for amblyopic or for amblyopic patients that you were just talking about, but just to take a step back. So once we have obtained the dry and wet retinoscopy results for these patients, what are some questions we need to ask ourselves before deciding the most appropriate spectacle prescription for our patient? So one thing I would say is make sure that you're really happy with the direction that you're planning on going before you cycloplege the patient. Um, you know, once you do that, the exam's over for the day, right? You're, you're essentially just getting one more data point 
um, you know, of course, checking health and everything inside the eye. But, you know, you're, you're essentially getting one more data point and then you're saying we're, we're done here because there's nothing else that can be measured at that point. Um, and you have to keep in mind that what the cycloplegic refraction is telling you is the maximum amount of plus that is available in that eye. So it's, it's giving you a top amount, but it's not giving you the prescription. Okay. Um, so, you know, unshackle yourself from the idea that what you, you know, you put the drops in and what you measure, that's, that's the prescription. I mean, even doing some sort of arbitrary cut by, you know, cycloplegic minus a half or cycloplegic minus three quarters, that we're, we're really not doing our patients any service when we do that, because we have absolutely no idea how the patient is going to react to actually wearing those on a day-to-day -day basis when they don't have drops in their eyes. Right. Um, so, you know, what, one of the things that we have to consider is how amblyopic is this patient? Um, how old is my patient? What is my patient doing on a daily basis? Uh, so if this is, let's say, your five-year-old patient who has come in for their first eye exam, and this is when you're finding that they're amblyopic, well, a five-year-old's likely in senior kindergarten. What does senior kindergarten look like? Are they online? <laughs> um, yeah. Cool right now, or, or are they actually in person? Um, you know, how much screen time does this child get? Is this someone who plays sports? You know, are they in, in hockey on the weekends and three times during the week? Um, or is this someone whose nose is touching a screen for three quarters of the day? Um, so we have to look at a lot of what the patient is spending their time doing so that we can make sure that we're addressing the prescription and the, the needs that are going to make the most sense for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in terms of more of, of the um, specifics of that, what we want to do, again, is provide the best possible visual acuity for your amblyopic eye. And the way that I do that in a subjective is I start at zero. So I start at Plano. So I get my RET, I find what that, you know, plus four or, or plus 450 or whatever it is, and then I take it out. And I start at zero when I do my subjective refraction. And I start with just single letter and kind of see, you know, they have to earn the plus from me. You know, you've got to demonstrate that it makes a difference if I'm going to actually leave it in the foropter. And it doesn't have to take long. You know, mm -hmm. what's this letter? Well, I have no idea. Okay, well, here's two clicks of plus. What's that letter? Oh, it's a P. Great. What's this letter? No idea. Give me a guess. T. You're right, you know. So hmm. really, kind of working out with them, and it can be fun. It can be a game, and you can even, you know, make sound effects. You know, what what letter is that? It's an O. <laughs> <laughs> yes, again, you know. Uh, and and so in in that way, not they're not scared of you, and mm -hmm. they're not dreading coming to see you because it's fun and it's a game. Mm -hmm. um, and so once you've found what that best acuity is you don't give them more plus. So if making, if, if giving more plus doesn't give you smaller letters, then there's no sense in having it. Yeah. So what you'll find very often is that if they're unaided 2060 um, and with that ret that you measured, they're 2050 minus, starting at zero, maybe at two or 250, they're at a 2040. Mm -hmm. Right? And you never would have known that if you left that plus four in the foropter when you were done your ret. Yeah. So taking it all out, starting at zero, finding the least possible plus that gives the best possible acuity is what you're looking for in that amblyopic eye. For the non-amblyopic eye, I tend to treat that a little bit differently. And again, this is kind of where the, the patient themselves comes in and where age plays a big factor. Um, and how amblyopic the patient is becomes a factor. Um, because if you leave that eye as the, the leader eye, um, then it's going to continue to lead, even when you have the best possible acuity on the amblyopic eye. So what I do is I will give more plus in the amblyopic eye than what I measure in the subjective. Um, so what I do typically is I start with whatever I found as the dry ret in the non-amblyopic eye. 
Um, mm -hmm. And let's say that gives 20, 20 minus typically, right? If they're unaided Plano, maybe you can get a quarter uh, on your dry rat or maybe even plus 50 on your dry rat. Um, and that's maybe 20, 25. Mm -hmm. Then what I do is I see, all right, how much plus can I possibly give you and not make you completely blurry? Yeah. And, and that definition of, you know, what's okay, what's completely blurry, what's acceptable, that's very patient driven. So mm -hmm. for a five-year-old who's doing senior kindergarten, I can probably keep them around 20, 30. Yeah. If I have someone who is in grade six, who's looking at the front of the class to see the smart board, 20, 30 is not going to cut, not going to cut mm -hmm. it. You need to give them more. Um, otherwise what they're going to do is take a, take them off, peak, yeah. right? Uh, take off the glasses or, or peek around them. And, and that kind of defeats the entire purpose. Um, so we need to give them enough plus that we are giving the brain the opportunity to use the other channel. Yeah. Okay. Um, and really, you have to remember that this is not full time occlusion. I have people say also, oh, you're just, you're just penalizing with plus. And it's like, well, sort of but kind of but not really only at distance yeah because at near you're actually providing more support um and, and clearer vision with that you know ad in place yeah yeah i didn't think of it that but, way yeah yeah it, it's and especially you know what are kids doing mostly right now anyway mm -hmm. is screens it's a lot of new work yeah. a lot of new work so what we're doing is we're still allowing them to have that clear vision when they're doing their close work, their school work, you know, the, the detail work that really matters to them um, is still nice and clear, as well as we have the best possible visual acuity in mm -hmm. amblyopic eye, right? This is where the vision therapy really is going to shine because mm -hmm. we're not just leaving it for those you know, times here and there where the patient happens to be looking at the front of the classroom or watching TV or happens to be looking out the window for two seconds before they go back to their game, right? Um, this is where we're really giving guided exposure and visual experience through training. Um, so if patients don't do vision therapy and they only do the um, glasses, it's going to take a very, very long time <laughs> um, yeah. for them to get success with it, but you are going to get better binocular outcomes. So you will get an improvement in stereoacuity, which you would not get just from patching alone. And um, in the video, you mentioned that you only do this method if the amblyopic eye is 2060 or less, right? You can, you can push that a little bit. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't use it as a hard line. Um, but what you have to consider is that no one wants to be that blurry. And, and this is mm -hmm. the number one reason why patching fails, right? Mm -hmm. Is because they're essentially being forced to use a very blurry eye. Um, and so if this is someone who's very young, you know, three years old, you could push that definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, you know, they're so busy and they don't really need detail in yeah. the distance. You know, being 2040, even in the distance, 2050 is not the end of the world if the only thing that you're doing is, you know, watching Paw Patrol. Yeah. <laughs> TV, looking up and on the mantle, right? It's, it's true. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, that their, their visual acuity needs are a lot less. And so they tend to be a lot more tolerant of that blur. Mm -hmm. uh, but for adult patients, they're very grumpy to give up any acuity. And so they really, really have to be on board and you have to trial frame that first and say, listen, if we want to go down this road, this is what it's going to be like. And you need to like pinky promise me right now that you are going to wear these glasses anyway, even when you think, why did I agree to this? This sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, at, at least you can have that honest conversation with an adult and say, you know, this is what you're in for really are you in because we don't have to do this mm -hmm. so if we were to try and approach this specialized prescribing how often should we follow up to monitor for any visual changes well i kind of mentioned before if, if i have the patient vision therapy i'm following up with them every eight to ten sessions anyways and that's weekly mm -hmm. so, you know every two to three months let's say um, is what i'd be following up 
if they weren't doing VT, as I said, this is going to take longer. So probably I'd be looking at around the three to four month mark mm -hmm. uh, to be kind of rechecking the acuity and adjusting the glasses as I need to. So yeah. what you find over time is that the um, non-amblyopic eye actually does start to relax and release more plus. And so they come back and they might have been, you know, 20, 30 plus when you prescribe the glasses and now they're 20, 20 minus with that same mm -hmm. prescription, which is great because it gives me the opportunity to increase the plus on the non-amblyopic eye to get that visual acuity level back mm -hmm. and likely decrease the plus on the amblyopic eye because what yeah. we find is that subjective refraction does come down. So again, I take all that plus out, even if it was just 250 at that point, um, start at zero and mm -hmm. work my way up and see what the acuity is. Um, and I have a number of, you know, what I call recovered amblyopes that are now 2020 OU with equal prescriptions mm -hmm. that started out, for example, at, you know, plus a quarter plus four that are now wearing 150 OU. Wow. And once you get to that point where you have that, you know, equal um, prescriptions, you're just in a holding pattern, essentially, at that point. Yeah. Um, this, this specialized prescribing pretty much sounds like an updated, more modern and useful version of like using a Bangerter filter instead of an eye patch. Because so I guess for anyone who's listening, who still may not be really caught on with this method, you know, if you think about the reason why we used a Bangerter filter was because we didn't want to fully occlude the non-amblyopic eye. So we gave a filter that blurred the vision, but still provided light. But now you are just amplifying that treatment by at least still, you know, improving their vision in the non-amblyopic eye to around 2025, 20, 2030, 20, so they can still function binocularly. Yeah, um. there's, there's pros and cons to, to each. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I have a lot of colleagues whom I respect very much who prefer to do the yeah, um, the filter way of, of doing this. And the benefit to doing the, the filter method is that you don't have such limited exposure to mm -hmm. the penalization, right? As yeah. I kind of mentioned, you're really only penalizing in the distance if you're using mm -hmm. plus and at near you're not at all. Yeah. Um, with the filters, it's full time, right? As long yeah. as they wear the glasses. Mm -hmm. The downside to it though, is that you're not addressing the anisometropia. Right. So mm -hmm. you're still going to have a large difference between the two lenses at the end of, of your treatment. And plus, if you're asking this patient to wear the glasses full time, they still look different. So it's not the same as, as going to school with the eye patch on, but the glasses don't look like mm -hmm. the other kids glasses do. Um, <clears throat> and so there is still that kind of social impact. I have a question for anyone who may be interested in, in, you know, experimenting with this sort of a treatment, you know, if the glasses prescription may have to be updated every couple of months, how do you get around, um, your optical with, you know, how do you work with your optical and your opticians to help the patients, you know, afford all of these lens changes within the year? Is there any like tips or any tricks around insurance or anything that you've learned to yeah. help that? Um, you know, there are some uh, lens companies who mm -hmm. are actually offering growing plans where mm -hmm. they do kind of allow a certain number of lens changes within a certain amount of time. Um, so we're, we're pretty good at kind of steering patients who we know are going to need a lot of lens changes um, to you know, go those routes. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is we just educate, educate, educate the, the parents that, you know, we're doing this for a purpose and this is the expectation is that there's going to be a lot of lens changes um, until we get to a point where things stabilize. So if, if we have a patient who's doing vision therapy, you know, let's be honest, the, the glasses are not going to be the expensive part that they really need to worry about, right? It's, yeah. it's going to be the vision training where the majority of the investment is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, I don't get a lot of concern about the actual lens changes, mm -hmm. especially when the parent is seeing 
the change in the acuity, you know, in, in the amblyopic eye, when they see the benefit, especially if this is someone who's come from another office and they're, um, you know, a, a, a patch dropout, they're thrilled that yeah. things are getting better and they didn't have to, you know, threaten to take away their favorite toy for not wearing the glasses or yeah. not wearing the patch or whatever it is. Um, so they're, they're in. Cause I, I always feel that every time I find a new amblyopic patient, I educate the parents. I, you get so nervous picking that final prescription that you're going to give them because you know that, you know, most opticals will probably have a one-time, you know, exchange policy within 30 days. And you're like, well, I only, I need to follow up with you in, you know, six to eight weeks. So there goes the exchange policy down the drain. And then when you see them back for the follow-up, you're really praying that their vision improved with these glasses so that you don't have to have that conversation with the parents and say, oh, we might have to change the lenses again. I, I even get nervous. You know, um, I feel a lot of pressure to get the prescription right the first time. Um, but the way that you described it is something that I'm going to keep in mind now telling my patient's parents that, you know, well, if they come in for the follow-up and the VAs are improving, clearly these glasses and the method of using glasses is helping. So if we need to change that, it's worth the money to invest in improving their vision by changing the lenses. Yeah. And you look at it from, from this method, really Mm -hmm. the way that, I have my parents think about the lenses is this is the medicine mm-hmm. like and, therapy. And, and as the symptoms improve, the dose changes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the fact that the dose changes is not something that I'm upset about, right? If, if we need a, a, a weaker dose, mm-hmm. that's something to be happy about. That's something to be celebrated. And, and I find that now, if I tell a parent you know what, I, I think we're going to need to keep the glasses prescription the same. I actually feel worse about that than by saying, oh, we have to change the lenses. Because to me, when we're changing the lenses, it's because there's been enough of, of an acuity improvement that we need to adjust things again. So if it's stable, it means that we're not making much progress. So yeah. you know, it's a way of kind of flipping that expectation on its head, that the expectation is that the glasses prescriptions should change because things are getting better. And I need to lower it, you know, now it was 250. Now I only need it to be at a two. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just, it's the way that you're changing their expectations. This was a great conversation. I think it just really sheds a whole different perspective on amblyopia treatment and therapy and what amblyopia is right. Like a binocular issue. So you know, us BV people, we still kind of, we just shout it to everyone and we yell, amblyopia is a binocular issue. And everyone's just kind of like, okay, all right, well, I'm still going to give this patch because it's easier. So get out of my face. But now you've explained it in a way that just makes more sense, hopefully to a lot more people as to why you should not be carrying the patches in your office if you're not doing therapy with it. You know, it's, um, we have a specialty for a reason, just like we refer all of our dry eye patients to the dry eye specialist. Um, you know, we give our glaucoma patients to the low vision specialist. There's a reason we have vision therapy. So when you have an amblyopia patient, it's always going to benefit them to give a VT referral. You're, you're referring them for the best thing possible for them and let, let the parents make the decision if they want to go that route versus not offering it it at all, then you're, you're not giving the patient that, um, you're not giving them the option. You're not doing them the the best service in my opinion. Well, the the way that I kind of talk to our colleagues about it when, you know, I have the opportunity to verbally slap some people yeah, (laughs) is say, you know, as as I know, um, some, some good friends of mine who are dry eye Mm -hmm. specialists or, or people who, who do a lot of dry eye in their clinics. Yeah. Um, and if I said to them, oh, I had this patient who was super, super symptomatic and I, you know, gave them an artificial tear, 
Yeah. And you're like, be... what is wrong with you? Oh, so man. You're, you're, you're not helping your patient. You're sticking yeah. a band aid on it and getting them out of your office because you don't want to deal with it. Yeah. And it's like, you just suck an eye patch on this amblyopic patient. To get them <laughs> the out of physical band aid that you literally right? put on their eye. <laughs> you cover the entire eye, right? I mean, yeah. when, when I have a patient who has significant dry eye symptoms, I'm not just giving them an artificial tear and yeah. saying, here, use this, because that's also what everyone else has done for them. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't helped them either. Mm -hmm. So why are we continuing to repeat these things that our patients are telling us it's not working? I don't yeah. want this. Yeah. Um, you know, we need to be able to offer them something better. And there's nothing worse than having a patient come back to you and say, you know, my neighbor my neighbor's kid went to this vision therapy and he never had to wear a patch. How come I didn't, how come you didn't tell me about that? Yeah. That's a conversation that no one wants to have. Mm -hmm. And if I had a patient that came back and said, you know, my, my bridge partner said that they went and had something on, you know, done to their eyes and now their, their, their tears are fantastic and they don't have dry eye anymore. How come you just gave me this bottle of tears? Yeah. You know, I would have some explaining to do. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to look at the subspecialties that are within our profession and we need to take advantage of them because our patients are going to find out <laughs> that they have not been, um, you know, fielded into the right areas mm -hmm. and they're not happy when they find out. We should be celebrating the fact that there are places for these patients that don't fit into that general primary care model. Mm -hmm and making sure that we're getting them the care that they need. Yeah. And our final thoughts from you, Dr. Donati. So is there any other advice that you'd like to provide to our listeners who are mostly new grad optometrists or optometry students? Um, any advice for when it comes to managing and or treating amblyopia? I guess just generally speaking, don't be afraid to take a step back and look at the numbers that you've gotten and think about what you want to prescribe. So just because there's certain numbers that are on the Feropter, it doesn't mean that you have to write them down and sign it. Take a minute, look at it from the big picture perspective and don't be afraid to trial frame what you're thinking of and check it again. So, you know, you think I, I couldn't possibly be giving this child, I just driver, you know, did a dry ret and they're playing on plus four Am I really thinking of prescribing them 0.75 and a two? Is that really what I'm thinking of right now? Trial frame it, check the mm. stereo. I bet you it's better. Check their worth four dot. I bet you it's better. You know, check their visual acuity. I bet you it's better. Um, you know, and, and that way you can be confident with what you're prescribing and know that you are not hurting people by not giving them the cycloplegic refraction. Doesn't mean you don't have to measure it. Yeah. But you don't have to <laughs> prescribe it. Um, that LDQ lecture, like what Rab was saying was really mind blowing to me as well. <laughs> yeah. When I saw it, I just like, it's like one of the lectures, um, from LDQ that I'll watch a few times just because I was like, oh, this is not really what we learned in school. And I had like a method of like how I would treat my amblyopic patients. And now that's completely changed because of you. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, this makes way more sense. Good. You know, this kind of management and treatment is more better for the, uh, the child patients too, because I've always run into that problem where it's like, no, they don't, they're not going to patch or they're not going to wear their glasses. And I'm always like, well, what, what's the next step? Like, what do mm -hmm. we do after this? And, you know, this kind of new treatment or method will be helpful for sure. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for doing that lecture. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm glad we got to talk about it more. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to plug VTC membership if I can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. You know, vision therapy Canada, as I kind of said at the beginning is, um, your Canadian national organization that's dedicated to the advocacy of vision therapy in Canada. Um, and so even your listeners who are in the U S or elsewhere in the world, there is international membership and membership in vision therapy. Canada is not only for those who provide vision therapy in their office. Um, although if you do and you're a Vision Therapy Canada, or if you do provide vision therapy in office and you're a, a full member of VTC, you do get a listing on our find a doctor locator page. 
Um, but even if you don't do VT in office, you can still be a partial member and you still get all the membership benefits, um, including some pretty awesome discounts at uh, places like uh, Staples Printing and different uh, equipment and things like that and mm. access to our online resources. So all the studies uh, that everyone says don't exist, there's like hundreds of them that you can actually <laughs> read if yeah. you're so inclined to do so uh, are all listed there as well. Um, so check it out. It's visiontherapycanada.com and we do have our virtual conference coming up in August so everyone can Ooh. stay safe and we are going to have two and a half days dedicated to primitive reflexes and strabismus and amblyopia care. So I hope if you like this that you'll be able to sign up for that as well. Registration okay. is opening up very soon.